All right. Lesson 13, which is titled, Two Murders. We'll read from 2 Samuel chapter 3. There was some trouble between Joab and Abner. We had seen that in last lesson. And we've seen, sadly, the civil war between God's own people. David is not yet king of all of Israel. Remember, he was anointed king by Samuel, so he is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord has not yet placed him on the throne over all of the tribes. And that still creates some trouble and animosity and competition. So we'll see that here. Uh, I'm going to start reading at verse 22 of 2 Samuel chapter 3. Make sure you're there. 2 Samuel chapter 3, beginning at verse 22. And behold, the servants of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop and brought a great spoil with them. But Abner was not, in, was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away. And he was gone in peace. When Joab and all the hosts that were with him, they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and he has sent him away, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What hast thou done? Behold, Abner came unto thee. Why is it that thou hast sent him away, and he is gone? Thou knowest Abner, the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee, and to know thy going out and thy coming in, and to know all that thou doest. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, which brought him again from the well of Sirah. But David knew it not. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly, and smote him there under the fifth rib, that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. So David had sent Abner away after he had talked. Remember, Abner said, I'll go and I'll get all these other men on your side. So David had sent him away, even though Abner had been an enemy, even though Abner had been serving of Saul, David works with him. He sends him away to get those other tribes to join. Meanwhile, while Abner is on the way out, Joab is on the way in. Okay? Remember, Joab's the right-hand man of David, the leader of David's soldiers. And these men had, were probably coming back from some uh, battle that they had fought, some expedition in which they had gone out and defeated the enemy and probably had looted or plundered everything. They probably had gold and silver and weapons and everything else. And Joab hears from his men that Abner had just come in, or from maybe the servants or some, but that Abner had come in. He had spoken with David, and David had allowed him to go in peace, the enemy of Joab the old enemy of David. So Joab comes in and he scolds David. What were you thinking? He's a man of slyness, of trickery. He's like a fox. He's not here for you, David. He's here for himself. He's just trying to keep himself alive. He's in here gathering information. He's spying on you. He's the friend of Ishbosheth the son of Saul, who right now is king. He's not on our side. How dare you let him go? And obviously Joab also, in his heart, was angry because his brother Asahel had been killed by Abner. So you have to understand that, too. That's why I say it's important that we understand when we're discussing something, maybe you need correction, you need punishment. First, let us discuss and figure out what is at the heart of the matter. What is in your heart? What is it that you really want? You're telling me all these words, but what's in your heart? And that's what we see here with Joab. He's telling David all these words, but in his heart is the fact that he's jealous of Abner. In his heart is he's probably afraid that Abner could take his place. And in his heart is anger at Abner for having killed his brother. Okay? So, uh, David is not going to do anything here. We don't see him uh, be willing to do anything. So Joab uses some trickeration of his own. He knows Abner's not afar off. He gathers a couple of swift messengers and tells them, go out to Abner and tell him to return. Tell him to come back. Okay? Uh, and he probably, we don't know, we don't read this, but more than likely, he lied. He probably said, if, tell him that this message is coming from the king. So when the messengers run out and they meet Abner, of course Abner's going to go along with it. Oh. He wants me back. 
I'll come back. And so Abner turns around and begins coming back towards the city. And there Joab waits in the gate. That's often the meeting place for the wise men or many others. We've talked about that in the, in the, uh, before. So Joab's there is waiting for him. And he calls Abner aside. And Abner, thinking that this is a message of the king, he doesn't think of any foul play here. He's not thinking. He's just left David in peace. So he feels that probably Joab is on his side too. So that when Joab says, Abner, come with me. I've got something to tell you in private. Let us go over here. Abner goes with him. He doesn't suspect any foul play out of Joab. And what does Joab do? When he gets him into a private place, he takes a knife or a long sword or short sword and he shoves it into the chest okay, of Abner so that he dies. And Abner bleeds out. So why would Joab do such a thing? Why would he kill him while we had... He uses the great reason as the excuse, well, he killed my brother, so I'm avenging my brother. Really, what we have to realize, again, is the heart of Joab. We don't know exactly what was there, but we can speculate that he was, again, a jealous man. He didn't want Abner to be important in the eyes of David. He wanted to be the man in charge. Okay? He also probably was afraid of losing his important place with David. I'm the right-hand man. I'm the captain. But if Joab didn't do some things right, maybe Abner would be put into his place. Okay? And then also, he, because he had killed his brother, he hated him. Hate is probably the main issue here. Although jealousy played a large part, the wicked, sinful hate in his heart caused him to kill. This is murder. You see, Asahel had been killed in battle. God sanctifies killing in battle. I may not kill any man or shoot any man or do anything along those lines here. But if my country calls me up and asks me to go serve over in Syria and gives me a weapon and trains me how to use it, I am allowed to kill. That is sanctified by God. When the army of Israel was fighting, that type of fighting and murder during those battles were okay. The government had called them to do that, and the Lord gives the government the permission. So Asahel's murder was a good, it wasn't a murder, it was a good killing. This is murder, because he does not have the permission of the Lord to do it. But the key there is his heart. His heart is filled with hatred. Now, what does David say when he hears this? Pick it up there at verse uh, 28. And afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever. From the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it rest on the head of Joab and on all his father's house. And let there not fall fr fail from the house of Joab one that hath an issue, or that is a leper, or that leaneth on a staff, or that falleth on the sword, or that lacketh bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, slew Abner because he had slain their brother Asahel at Gibeon in the battle. And David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, Rend your clothes and gird you with sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David himself followed the bier. And they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner a, as a fool dieth? Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put into fetters. As a man falleth before wicked men, so fellest thou. And all the people wept again over him. And when all the people came to cause David to eat meat while it was yet day, David swears, saying, So do God to me, and more also, if I taste bread or aught else, till the sun be down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them, as whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people in all Israel understood that day that it was not of the king to slay Abner the son of Ner. And the king said unto his servants, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel? And I am this day weak, though anointed king, and these men the sons of Zariah be too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. So David's reaction to this murder is... Great sadness. He wanted to make sure that the people didn't think he had ordered Joab to do this. That's what it would look like. It would look like David wants to become the king. 
Abner is controlling Ishbosheth in the north. I know. Let's kill Abner, the people might think. That's what David had said. And so David needs to make perfectly clear to the people that is not the case. If he had ordered the killing of Abner, he would rejoice. He'd have a feast. He'd be happy. But that's not. He rents his clothes and he orders the other people in the palace and he orders Joab to do it. And then when it comes time for the funeral, David and his men walk right behind the bier, the casket, showing all the people they can see the king is saddened by this. This is not something that the king wanted done, but this is something that has made him sad. And in David speaking with Joab, he speaks a curse. And you were asked that question there on that sheet. Can David really bring down a curse upon the head of Joab in his house? No. This is God using David and speaking through David this curse. And it's a miserable curse. Every family in, the, in Joab's family is going to have something. A disease, a, die, a die, violent death. They're going to be living in poverty, crippled, maimed, who knows what. No family will escape the pain and anguish. And it's all because of their father or grandfather, Joab. He was an evil man. Uh, he wasn't humbled by this. It was all about him being powerful. It was his heart that was in the wrong place. So David shows uh, great sadness. Uh, now, we might want to know, why didn't God, or why didn't David take Joab and throw him in prison? This is murder. Why would he not do that? But the Lord is working here. David will need Joab to be his right-hand man to go out into battle and help lead the battles for David. So God is working here. He's going to use Joab, although wicked, he has a great military ability, and that will help him. All right. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel 4. Just read through a bit of the first part here. Another murder happens. Okay. And we're also introduced to somebody that we have to remember their name. will come up later. Chapter 4. And when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble. So Saul's son, this means here, is Ishbosheth. He's afraid. And all the Israelites were troubled, and Saul's son, again meaning Ishbosheth, had two men that were captains of bands. The name of one was Bana, and the other was Rechab. The sons of Rimmon, a Beerothite of the children of Benjamin, for Beeroth was also reckoned to Benjamin. And the Beerothites fled to Gidom, and were sojourners there until this day. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass that she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So we'll come back to Mephibosheth later, but basically his, his nanny, his nurse, was running with him and she dropped him and he became paralyzed, lame. Verse 5. And the sons of Rimmon the Beerothite, Rechab and Bana, went and came about, by the, came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who lay on a bed at noon. And they came thither into the midst of the house, as though they would have fetched wheat, and they smote him under the fifth rib. And Rechab and Bana, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he lay on the bed, his bed in the bedchamber, and they smote him, and slew him, and beheaded him, and took his head, and gat them away through the plain all night. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David to Hebron, and said to the king, Behold, the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life. And the Lord hath avenged my lord, the king, this day of Saul, and of his seed. And David answered Rechab and Bain and his brother, the sons of Rimmon, the Beerothite, said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity? When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to him brought good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag, who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. How much more when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house under upon his bed? Shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they slew them, and cut off their hands and their feet, and hanged them up over the pool in Hebron. And they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulchre of Abner in Hebron. Alright, so the last murder is a similar murder, or similar situation at least, to the young Amalekite that we remember. So, uh, Ishbosheth is still a king up there. He's got some servants, this Bana and Rechab. It must have not been uncommon for them to be walking around in the king's house. So they're passing through the king's house. They pass through unnoticed. And they even go in unto the king. So probably the people trusted them. There's no other servants there. Now, 
God is also working here to make sure there were no other servants there. And what do they do? Well, Ishbosheth is lying on the bed, probably sleeping. They take a dagger, thrust it in under his fifth rib so that it kills him. He dies. Then they behead him. They cut off his head, and they take that head and probably flee out a window or a door or some way so that they're not seen, and they take off for David. They want to find David and bring the head of Ishbosheth because they think, look, Abner is dead. The only thing standing between David and the throne is Ishbosheth. Let us kill our Lord, Ishbosheth. We'll take the head to David and he'll give us a great reward because he'll love us so much because of what we did for him. And so they go running and they get there before David and they tell what has happened. And David says, shame on you. Haven't you heard of what happened to the Amalekite? He thought he brought me good news when he told me the story that he had killed Saul. Saul was an unrighteous man, and not only that, he died out on the battlefield in a place where death does happen. You, you've murdered an innocent man, and you did it in his own bed. This is not a place of battle or war. I didn't order you to do this. You have committed the sin of murder, and for your sin, you will be punished too. So David orders his servants to take these men, to kill them, cut off their hands and their feet, because their hands, because they killed Ishbosheth with their hands, their feet, because they had fled to David to tell the news, hoping for a reward, which they now got none, nothing else than death. And David hanged their bodies in a very public place so that all the people could see what would happen to someone who would do something like this. And then David took back that head of Ishbosheth and buried it with uh, Abner there. Okay. So, uh, again, we see here that David has refused to take over the kingdom by violence. It's real tempting to do that, to take something over by violence. David has not fallen into that trap. And that's something that we can learn, too. We ought to be careful. We don't settle our problems or our disputes with violence. Fighting, hitting, even using our words as hurtful stones that injure the enemy. It's not the right way to go about it. We go about it with a good godly manner. We discuss it with someone, maybe the person that we have the problem with. We use the scriptures. We bring the scriptures with us if we have to defend our point or if we have to question. We bring the scriptures. And when we do that in the proper and right way, that is how we can solve our problems. Not through murder, killing, uh, beating up, being unkind, using hurtful words. It's not the God-ordained way of solving problems. Talk to them. Bring the word. And that is one way that we can solve a lot of these problems.